Welcome to our presentation on refugee resettlement in the Treasure Valley of Idaho. The Treasure Valley Refugee Watch is just a group of Idahoans who are especially interested in fixing the broken refugee resettlement system because there are some problems with it, such as having to pay for something we don't support, the terror sponsoring uh, countries the refugees come from, and their improper vetting. We have to know who's coming to Idaho. We're not against immigration, immigrants, or refugees, but we are against those who come here from war-torn countries whose objective is to infiltrate the refugee resettlement system and just come here to do damage. So our goal is to educate Idahoans as to the refugee resettlement program and how it is operating in Idaho at the present time. In October of 2015, we started a petition drive to get an advisory question about refugee resettlement on the May ballot. We collected 3,300 signatures from people who wanted everybody to be able to vote on this question so that our elected officials could know unmistakably what public opinion is regarding refugee resettlement. So the petition signers, they voiced four major concerns about the refugees coming here. One was security, then public safety, financial burden, and the negative impact on the community. We will cover each one of these separately. The number one concern was security. Do we really need to accept all of these refugees at this time? We don't think so. How often do you see large numbers of, men, of women and children in these refugee photos? The majority of the refugees coming here are military age males from the ages of 18 to 35. There's been a number of congressional hearings on refugees and here's some of the quotes from the uh, officials that attended those meetings. Barbara Strack, Homeland Security Department Refugee Affairs Division Chief said that over 90 percent of Syrian refugee applicants get approved despite the absence of background information. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson said it is true that we are not going to know a whole lot about the Syrians that come forth in this process. And why is that? No background information. Here's a familiar quote by FBI Director James Comey. Nothing is going to show up because there's no record of that person. Nothing has been collected, and we can query the databases till the cows come home and we won't find a thing. And then there's James Clapper, Director of National Intelligence. An obvious understatement when he said, we don't obviously put it past the likes of ISIL to infiltrate operatives among these refugees. And why is that an understatement? because ISIS promised to infiltrate the U.S. refugee resettlement program. And even recently in these countries, and more by now, ISIS operatives have repeatedly attempted to infiltrate the refugee flow, and they have done it very successfully, I might add. The second concern was public safety. These are alarming statistics. 400,000 refugees entered the U.S. since 2010, and not a one was screened for the HIV virus. And we have no idea where these people are, because after four months of getting services, they're released and they are not tracked. Equally alarming is this flesh-eating disease that is sweeping across Syria. A recent news article said that Boise has even more Syrians than Los Angeles and New York City combined. Well, we have a lot more scheduled to come here from Syria. Between 2011 and 2015, seven refugees with active tuberculosis were diagnosed, diagnosed shortly after their resettlement in Idaho. Now, these people are supposed to have medical screenings before they leave for the United States. So tuberculosis, it's highly contagious, and these refugees could be anywhere and could have infected any number of people. Also, there's eight diseases on the rise in Idaho in the Magic Valley, and two of these, as you will note, are sexually transmitted diseases. 
And the Magic Valley is where Twin Falls is located, which just happens to be the other major destination in Idaho for refugees. Did you know that there is already a federal law on the books that addresses diseased aliens coming to the United States? It says that they are ineligible if any alien has been determined to have a communicable disease of public health significance. Well, don't you think all these diseases are of public significance? And yet the refugees just coming to Idaho just keep pouring in. You've most likely seen this first incident, a sexual assault of a five-year-old girl by three refugee boys in Twin Falls just this past June. And a second, a, a second assault, sexual assault in Twin Falls as well by a refugee was done to a mentally retarded woman. You know, there's plenty of proof in other countries that this behavior is commonplace and is actually acceptable among the refugee populations. In fact, in one refugee rape account, when he was asked why he did it, he said, I was having a bad day. And besides, it's only a woman. There was no violence in this refugee related incident, but when it happened, the patrons panicked and ran toward the, toward the door. This incident may not seem very serious, but let's count them up now. We've had one incident in June, this incident in July, and another incident in August. You see, it's the accumulation of refugee-related incidents that causes concern. How many American towns have their own local resident convicted of terrorism? Well, Boise. Boise is one of those. One of his projected targets was a Boise park. And if he'd had enough bombs, he wanted to kill a lot of military or everyone. Well, sure, he was fined and sentenced, but it was pretty minimal compared to the destruction he might have caused. So how do these refugees end up here? This chart shows the journey of the refugees take from their war-torn country until they are settled in the United States. We won't actually go through the details of this chart. You can examine it later. Basically, the chart showed that there are three main players in the refugee journey. They are the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees. He chooses the countries from which the refugees come and the numbers. Number two is the United States State Department Refugee Resettlement Director. He's informed by the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees of the refugees that are in the pipeline for uh, headed for the United States. And then three in Idaho in particular, Janus is a non-governmental nonprofit health and human services organization whose national headquarters just happens to be in Boise. And one of the Janus programs is the Idaho Office for Refugees, and that office contracts with the local refugee resettlement agencies, which we will look at later. Now, do you notice anything different, anything missing here? The refugees are coming to Idaho, but there is no Idaho governmental involvement in the refugee resettlement decision. Yes, taxpayer money is being spent, but no Idaho elective officials have any oversight, there's no transparent accountability, and no taxpayer input. So basically, the books on refugee resettlement in Idaho are closed. Your concern was the financial burden it places on all of us. Let's take a, look, a closer look at Janus. It is a non-governmental refugee resettlement contractor. It's the umbrella organization over uh, Idaho and it distributes the taxpayer money, but it's without any oversight or accountability. Here you have a non-governmental organization distributing governmental taxpayer money. Janus received $12 million this year and it has received for a number of years in tax grants for the 80 county refugees. And of that 11 million, almost 6 million of it goes for staff salaries and benefits. 
So you see less than half is actually going towards the refugees. You might hear the Idaho officials say that no Idaho money is going into the refugee resettlement. But look at these statements by, or this statement by the Office of Refugee Resettlement and the Governmental uh, Accountability Office. They say that in reality, the costs of the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program, now it has been shifted from being federal to the state and local governments because the federal government has chosen not to appropriate enough money to pay for its own program. How about that? So very soon, all of the costs of the refugees will be landing right in our own lap. Here are the four agencies uh, in Idaho. Three of them are in Boise. We have the Agency for New Americans, International Rescue Committee, and World Relief Treasure Valley here in, in Boise. Uh, the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Programs is operated out of Twin Falls. And look what we have here, the money trail. This is only a partial list of the goods and services that the refugees are all signed up for immediately upon arrival. We've got food, housing, child care, they even get cash and matching savings, new cars, education, health care, uh, legal services, lobbyists. They can have a business loan that they are never expected to repay. They also get fast track to citizenship and basically payment of all their bills. And these benefits far outweigh what the uh, welfare recipient who is a United States citizen receives. And here we have the grand total of what is coming out of your back pocket every five years without your knowledge or consent. $64,000 per refugee and $260,000 per household of four. And this is really so wasteful because it's already been documented that for the same amount of money that they can pay for one refugee being taken care of in the United States, they can take care of 12 of them in their own region. With all of the adult refugees coming into Idaho, there's even a larger number of children that are coming here. And they pose a very heavy financial burden on the Idaho school systems. We get 200 new refugee students every year in addition to what we already have and in the school year of 2015 and 16 we had a total of 1019. Also during this same school year there was a $860,000 impact grant to the Boise School District which included LEP which means limited English proficiency and uh, because these refugees have limited English proficiency of course they need to hire 22 more teachers and 23 additional paraprofessionals just to assist the refugee students so you can see this is a very very expensive program for you to have to fund I'm a retired secondary bi biology earth science teacher and I've been substitute teaching in the Boise School District for eight years. I began to notice that there was a lot of what I considered foreign students because I didn't know about the refugee resettlement program. I thought it was pretty interesting so I started listening to what the teachers and the volunteers were saying about the students and I wrote them down. Here's some of their observations, I won't read them all. Number five says, the refugee students are taught English until they are fluent. With two fluent languages, they have an unfair advantage over most American kids when they get into the job market. And number seven says, teachers have to dumb down the curriculum every year to accommodate the refugees. The teachers can't flunk them because they are students in these must-pass schools. The refugee resettlement industry is actually a $1 billion industry. Each of the agencies receive uh, $1,800 per head. 
for the refugees that they process and uh, the same amount for each member of their family that is imported to the United States later. Of the 4,650 refugees resettled in Idaho from 2011 to 2015, uh, there's a lot more than that because, remember, the program began in the 1980s. The Heritage Foundation found out that for every 10,000 refugees over their lifetime, it will cost the U.S. Treasury $6.4 million. And they will be low income, so they won't contribute much back into the system. So multiply $6.4 million by 100,000 or 200,000 uh, refugees that are being called for now. And you can e easily see how the refugee resettlement costs, which are, remember, being shifted to Idaho, uh, they, we are in danger of bankrupting our own state. Since, for the most part, over the last 30 plus years, the Refugee Resettlement Program has operated covertly, the American public has not noticed the powerfully negative impact it has. Persons to do research on the refugee resettlement industry and publish her findings is Anne Corcoran. She lived in a small eastern town where they dumped several hundred uh, refugees without any prior notification. If you would like to l listen to the story of her, what happened to her town and the research that she uh, found as a result, that's the first link. The second link is the legislators who are content with the way refugee resettlement operates now. And the last link is her current update of refugee resettlement through October of 2016. There are many epidemic refugee related problems that happen in every community that is overrun by refugees. The hospitals are affected, welfare system, and an already abysmal drug problem is added to. Let me refer again to that federal law uh, where the aliens are unfit to be admitted into the United States. It also says they are unfit if they are an illicit trafficker of any controlled substance. You see, this law has been on the book since 1952, but who is going to be courageous enough to enforce it? We're waiting. It doesn't take much also to notice other epidemic refugee related problems that are rampant in many other countries right now. Um, and we hope to keep them from happening in Idaho. Why are the refugees coming to Boise in particular? Well, Boise is considered by the United States State Department and the Office of Refugee Resettlement to be a preferred community. Notice the photo on the left. That is Boise downtown on the Grove, a beautiful area. Well, do you want downtown Boise to deteriorate into looking like the photo on the right? This is how Dearborn, Michigan looks and worse. So, is Boise next? Well, with the continuing flood of refugees coming to Boise, the likelihood of it happening is imminent unless we intervene. Looks just like a house in my neighborhood. The only difference is that instead of hanging the clothes on a pole, they hang it on the fence. And they have indoor furniture outside on the lawn for many weeks. There was, I don't know, six to ten cars parked all around the house, and you could barely squeeze by on the narrow street. A friend of mine lives uh, in a neighborhood where uh, she has refugees living right next door to her, and they are always throwing chicken bones under her shrubs. These are very common practices and behaviors in refugee neighborhoods, and you will notice that. My friend is very concerned, as well as uh, other neighbors of hers, that their property values are declining. And I would also like to mention that in the last couple of weeks, I have seen about a dozen refugee men, large and of military age, like I mentioned, walking at various times of the day on a very busy street near my neighborhood and also in the park. And I've seen this at another area of Boise, which a reliable source of mine has said the Somalis 
have chosen to uh, colonize, making a city within a city. Now, I'm not a fearful person, but myself and others are taking additional precautions now that even a year ago we wouldn't have considered. The homeless and jobless, they used to be the focus of our charity, but not anymore since the refugee resettlement craze is leaving them out in the cold. Some corporations in our state who are hiring do not think of hiring Idahoans first. And why is that? Because there is no money in it for them. But if they hire refugees, the government gives them a $2,400 per head tax credit. So you can see why entry level and low skilled jobs are going to the refugees first. A good example of the negative impact on Idaho's jobless is the meat packing plant that is being built in CUNA. The residents were all excited about the projected 600 new jobs, but there is a large population of Somali refugees living in CUNA and in other states where meat packing plants are built and refugees are available to hire for lower wages than the locals, the established pattern is that the refugees are hired instead. Chobani is another example of an Idaho corporation where many refugees are hired and there are others. Recently I watched a news report on the low-income housing that is being built in Boise. The project was praised because uh, it was going to be a good thing for the homeless who are currently living in Boise on the streets. Well, it probably sounded good to everybody but me because a few days before that I had attended a quarterly meeting of the refugee resettlement agencies and the person in charge of the meeting said that the biggest concern they were having was housing for the refugees. Combine that, her statement, with the statement of an employee that said 67% of the low income housing is given to the refugees. So 2 plus 2 equals, well, who do you suppose will be given the new low income housing? Uh, not too long ago, the Veterans Administration was exposed for their lack of proper care of the veterans. One out of four veterans are homeless and many are without jobs and having a hard time getting a job. And what's actually happening is they're being supplanted by the refugees who for the most part really have no desire to be here and have no alleg allegiance whatsoever to the country. So it's a very sad state of affairs that these men and women are veterans who have placed their lives on the line for us are being treated with such dishonor. There's an increasing number of negative encounters that the local citizens are having with refugees. They might not make the 10 o'clock news, but they are happening. Um, we included four examples from our conversations that we had with the peti petition signers, and you can read them later. I will just run through them quickly. One was from a bar owner in CUNA a young couple who had had previous experience with refugees, a person who had a refugee neighbor, and a French American who made an observation about what was happening here and its similarity to what happened in France. Now we're not the only ones who oppose refugee resettlement. The Zions Bank um, conducted a poll, the Dan Jones poll, where they found that most Idahoans are against taking refugee re ref serious. Also in opposition to refugee resettlement, the Idaho Republican Party State Central Committee at their winter meeting last January, they passed a resolution and the title of it was a resolution opposing the relocation of refugees from the United States Refugee Resettlement Program in Idaho. There is also a federal law that governs how refugee resettlement is to be conducted in a state. There is supposed to be at least quarterly consultations between the refugee resettlement agencies and local government officials regarding the sponsorship and intended distribution of the refugees. 
and that's supposed to happen before they are placed in the states and the cities. October 1st of 2015, Senator Jeff Sessions chaired a congressional hearing on refugees, and Larry Bartlett, Bartlett Refugee Resettlement Director, U.S. State Department, was asked uh, a question. He was part of a four-person panel, and this is the question that Senator Sessions asked Mr. Bartlett. Quote, in general, I believe you had some sort of consultation with communities about a desire to resettle a number of people in their community. What is your policy on that? And can you assure us that any community that would receive a direct flow of refugees would be consulted before this happens? Larry Bartlett claimed then that the refugee resettlement agencies consult very closely at a community level. They're required by his department to do consultations and he cited these elected officials, city council, mayor, at least a representative of the governor's office, and other people providing services such as schools, health clinics, medical service providers, law enforcement, volunteer groups. And he made this comment about consulting with us, the broad community. I'd like to read that verbatim. We want to talk to the broad community, not just the people who are involved exactly in the refugee program or resettlement program, but also people who are affected by it. I can assure you that we want to listen to every voice in the community. Not everybody is a supporter of refugees. Not everybody is a supporter of Syrian resettlement. Overwhelmingly, we find that the majority of citizens appreciate the program and support it. After listening to Larry Bartlett's testimony, there was two things that our committee wanted to know. We wanted to know what elected officials were consulted regarding whether or not the refugees could be resettled here. And number two, how was the broad community consulted? and what constituted every voice being listened to. So what we did was we submitted some public information requests to a number of organizations that Mr. Bartlett listed to see if these quarterly meetings were actually being held. If you wanna to listen to his testimony and to the testimony of the other members of the panel, the first two links are that. The third link is um, from the Twin Falls Public Forum where he described uh, the qualifications for a community to be chosen as a refugee destination. So here are the results of several of the public information requests. Governor's Otter had no record of any meetings. The legislators that we talked to had no record of being consulted. The Ada County Commissioner's Office only had a record of our meeting with them. And as far as the general public goes, they do have quarterly meetings with the refugee, uh, of the refugee resettlement agencies, but they're not widely advertised. And I have attended several of them. They're re they really have no consultation during the meeting. They are just activity reports that are given by the agency spokesperson. And the yearly meeting, the cost of it in 2015 was $90. I did attend it. I took eight pages of notes. And one of the things I found very surprising was at this two-day consultation, the whole second day was uh, teaching the people who work with the traumatized refugees how to recover from the trauma of working with the refugees. You see, refugees are very high maintenance and there's a lot of burnout among the refugee helpers of all of the nonprofit organizations. And we found no vehicle that the refugee resettlement agencies were using to consult the public to determine public opinion on refugee resettlement. So we decided to find out for ourselves by putting the advisory question, as I mentioned before, on the ballot. And this was by way of the Ada County Commissioners. And here is the Idaho statute that gives them authority to put an advisory question regarding any issue before the citizens of that county. And the any issue was refugee resettlement. And this is the question that we wanted them to put on the ballot. 
Do you support the refugee resettlement programs in Ada County funded by your tax dollars? Yes or no? You see, we figured that if we could get the commissioners to put this question on the ballot, then truly, quote, every voice in the, quote, broad community of Ada County could be heard. We presented an earlier version of this informational presentation to Commissioner Tibbs, and we informed him of the security risks, safety problems, financial burden, and the negative impact on the refugees. We went there in February and asked him to put it on the May ballot. And this, and I will also read our response to his response. He said, we can't do anything about the refugee resettlement because it's not in our jurisdiction. We said, we're not asking you to do anything about refugees. We're asking you to put the advisory question on the ballot, and this is in your jurisdiction. Then he also said, this is not how an advisory question is traditionally used. Well, from their uh, website, their vision statement says, that they will provide innovative and proactive solutions. And the only way they can do that is to break past some of the traditional methods. Um, after that he turned us down, we did try to do a real initiative, but we did not have enough time to get the projected 44,000 uh, signatures that we would need. So to, to inform a second commissioner about the security risks, public safety problem, financial burden and negative impact of refugees on the Treasure Valley. So we went to see David Case in August, this time asking him to put it on the ballot in November, which is coming right up. Uh, what we hoped was that we would get a favorable response from him and that he would uh, convince Commissioner Tibbs to join him in voting to put the advisory question on the November ballot. Once again, the decision was based on his opinion of the refugee resettlement program. He said it's a federal issue, uh, it won't solve your problems, we don't use taxpayer money, and it won't change the law. But our response was, your response is irrelevant to our request for an advisory question. Because according to Idaho statutes, it is your responsibility to put the advisory question on the ballot pertaining to any issue before the citizens of that county. So, because he uh, turned us down in the days after our presentation to Commissioner Case and before the deadline for what goes on the ballot, we alerted the citizens and we asked them to uh, write email the commissioners and they did great. They wrote and they called the commissioners asking them to put it on the November ballot, but again, to no avail. They ended up sending the citizens a boilerplate response letter, turning them down as well. So because the commissioners would not put the advisory question on the ballot so that we the people could advise our legislators on public opinion regarding refugee resettlement, we the people are going to have to go directly to our legislators. So here's the conclusion that our committee came to. The Idaho legislators need to be advised of public sentiment regarding refugee resettlement before the January 2017 legislative session begins so they can pass the appropriate law to protect the people of Idaho from the damage this covert unmonitored and unlawful refugee resettlement program will bring upon Idaho if left unchecked. This is the action we need to take now, all of us, from October to the end of December, which is right before the legislative session begins. We need to saturate Idaho with this timely information regarding refugee resettlement their agencies, their program, the pitfalls, and especially our recommendations. So we need to educate the public. Send the link to this video to everyone in Idaho that you know. Then also invite your family and friends to your house to watch the video with you. Number two, contact your legislators and insist that they pass legislation 
during the 2017 legislative session that says that we suspend participation in the state of Idaho in the refugee resettlement for a minimum of one year until it can be determined that we can handle these additional refugees. And these are the factors, all the ones that we discussed, they're the ones that need to be taken into consideration and researched and reported back to the legislators before we get back into participating in the refugee resettlement programs. Also, we need to codify into state law the federal requirements in the Refugee Act of 1980, which is that they have quarterly consultations. And this time we want to include not just with the local government, but the, the legislators specifically that they need to consult with them. And lastly, that we require that at, at each of these quarterly meetings that they have an I income and expenditure report for that quarter. Now, I want you to know that we are not alone in wanting to do this. There are 18 other states who have already proposed les legislation that deals with everything from amending the Refugee Act to auditing state refugee resettlement processes to prohibiting the use of state funds to support the refugee resettlement and declaring a moratorium like we would do and much more. So I would like to quickly read through the states that we are joining and also you will note that there the bill number and a short description is there which I won't read but you can read them later. So we are prou proudly joining Alabama, Arizona, California, Delaware, Florida, Kansas, Michigan, Nebraska, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, with lots of explanation, and finally, Wyoming. And here is the link to your legislators. The top link, you can find out the three that are in your district, but for this occasion, the refugee resettlement in Idaho is an urgent matter, so we all need to write them all. And in order to make this simple and easy, we've made a list of all the legislators' email addresses, which you can copy and paste into your address box, and then email your message to them all at once. Uh, this list is posted on our blog, and also posted there is a link to this informational presentation and the full text of the model refugee resettlement bill from which I patterned our proposed legislation. And let me make these suggestions when you're emailing your legislators. They do have a very small subject line, so limit your subject to two or three powerful words. And um, also in your uh, message, brevity is key. Pick out one or two of the points that you're most passionate about and emphasize them. The most important thing to emphasize, though, is that they pass legislation during this legislative session that puts the legislators on top of the refugee resettlement program in Idaho. Because truthfully, ladies and gentlemen, the refugees are the legislators are our last hope. you so much for listening and especially for taking action and we trust that your action will inspire your legislators to take action on your behalf and pass the appropriate legislation so god bless you richly we do have a source bibliography that is available upon request